everybody. Uh, Tom Spolvik here, market development manager for Domatic uh, for the uh, food and beverage industries. And uh, today we have a, a couple of really interesting guests. Uh, we have Hendrik Stachem. He's the former president of Coca-Cola for Germany, U.S. and uh, in Ecuador. He's uh, currently working as an advisor for uh, sustainability related uh, uh, startups and has a lot of fascinating insights. And uh, then we also have uh, Max Winrolk, who was the co-founder of uh, My Moosley. He's uh, currently involved in, in lots of different startups in the, uh, in the food and beverage space, uh, working on a kind of a very interesting one right now about uh, uh, cocoa and cocoa production, chocolate production in a, uh, in a very sustainable or far more sustainable fashion. So uh, I thank you all for joining us. So uh, one of the essentials of food and beverage and, and, and of life, really, is water usage. What do you, what do you both of you see as some of the, the impacts of, of water usage going, going forward, especially as it looks at, at, at droughts that are ravaging much of the, of the world today? But it's a very complex question, I would, I would say. Um, but... I think one thing is is crystal clear for for me, um, not not being forty years old yet, that I would still consider myself part of of a younger generation. And I think as kind of a a member, not, not from a business perspective, but as a member of society, I would I would argue that it's it's quite crystal clear that we can't continue to live like we have um, for the past decades. And so, um. I'm relieved to see that, that, that a lot of people share this, share this vision or share this view. And um, yeah, I think we can, we can all agree. Um, you don't need to see this panel for water usage and the sustainable use of water in, in, in life and in industry production is, is probably going to be a, a very important and one of the main topics um, going forward. Yeah, I, I, you know, we, we talk a lot about energy and, and energy is extremely important, but water is even more fundamental, you know? Um, so uh, just some of the, the study I've done or, or reading research about vertical farming, uh, there's been a lot of dialogue about the, the, the ener you know, is it energy neutral or not? And, and it, it may be that the water savings of that technology is even more substantial of an impact than, than the energy measurement. Any thoughts you might have, uh, Hendrik? Yeah, uh, I'd add that the numbers we are looking at are fairly huge by any standards. So we are, I think, 7.7 .7 billion population in the world today, headed towards 10 billion by 2050. When you look at the of the takeout of fresh water from surface and underground, about 70% of it is agricultural. So uh, that's just the current state, but with the population growth ahead that comes with more ascent to the middle classes and the need of more proteins and more complex foods, the projection is that we will need about 70% more water in those years up to 2050. So when you look at that, the numbers are very sizable, the challenges are sizable. And what I find fascinating is that from a sheer physical standpoint, there is no shortage of water in the world in totality. We have more water than we could possibly ever use with these, this size of population. The problem is the precision of getting it to the places where people live, where people conduct agriculture, and where people run factories. And that challenge to get to ever better levels of productivity, precision, and efficiency, I think, is at the heart of the challenge ahead of us. And that will require the whole man and the whole woman to, uh, to go about. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. Uh, we're going to transition at this point to, to the next topic. And, and that's something that uh, we deal with each and every day. And that's the topic of packaging and packaging in the future. And, uh, you know, how does that 
become in essence more sustainable what are those economics look like but then also as we move to to it be sustainable uh, from a practical sense, it still has to have a certain amount of durability. It's got to be able to contain safely the, the product inside it, but then also it needs to be able to be handled as it moves through the supply chain. So what are, what are some of each of your thoughts about the, um, the, this, the packaging of the future and, and, and what we think that might look like from the, the food and beverage industry? The impression I'm getting is that uh, the discussion revolves more around plastic fossil polymers than other forms of packaging. And the reason for that is I think that the uh, packaging of consumer goods in particular is the daily interface between a brand and its packaging and a consumer using that package and shopping for the package. So it's got a prominence that makes the theme of packaging so relevant in all sustainability discussions. About 40% of all plastic produced on the planet today goes into food packaging, which is very, very sizable. And then challenges are being noticed very clearly about the uh, fossil related emissions risk that comes with, with fossil based plastic, but also the litter and people more and more obviously see the concerns about uh, uh, contamination of oceans and landscapes with plastic litter. So it would seem to me that the journey forward will have one main vector, probably others, but one very important one, which is the reduction and the substitution of plastic by alternative materials, namely cellulose based, and then a whole range of innovations that allow for the emissions profile and the litter profile to get reduced. Uh, there's some fascinating innovation out there, such as uh, intelligent packaging that would be able to, for instance, emit certain substances that keep the product inside free of contaminants or send alerts to certain parameters like temperature that would make the product get, uh, uh, get bad faster. So uh, there is an enormous amount of opportunity for everybody involved in the substitution of plastic by other materials to move ahead faster and the handling of that throughout supply chains, through warehouses, through trucks, through ships, etc. And I think those opportunities have a lot to do with uh, automation with adaptable systems and the information technology that attaches to those. Thinking about this right now, it's I think from an entrepreneurial point of view, um, I'm, I think it's good to see that that finally it seems to me subjective point of view that that finally companies are really being rewarded from a consumer's point of view for really innovating in that space. And that's good to see because it seemed to me, and maybe um, you guys can also comment on this with more industry experience. Um, when, when I started out in the food and beverage industry in 2007, it, I, I think that the consumers really, they, they wanted, some of them wanted sustainable packaging, but as an entrepreneur, you, you had to overcome a lot of hurdles to become more sustainable in terms of packaging. And it, it, it took, and it still takes a lot of time, as you know, to, to really make a change. But, but now I think that consumers are really aware of it. They, they um, prefer brands that, that care about sustainability, be it about packaging or other aspects. And that, I think, is, is, is really good to see. Like, what would you say? Has it, has it really changed over, over the course of the last 10 to 20 years? The, the sta sustainability claim is, is clear to understand. Um, th that's now commands a premium in, in many consumers' eyes. So that's, that speaks clearer, I think, than anything, right? When the consumer's willing to pay more, um, yeah, yeah, they buy in. 
And just a moment ago, we we're, we're started talking about kind of that, almost this next area. Um, well, we start talking about the smart packaging and, and it's the, as we look forward uh, and think about health, wellness, uh, consumer behavior from a, from a food perspective, um, I, I find it fascinating just this the, the idea of intelligent packaging. I know there was uh, uh, recently I read a statistic that said uh, uh, the Who believes that uh, 600 million people annually suffer from some sort of foodborne illness. It's just an astounding number. Um, what what? How do you see the consumer's interest in health, wellness, uh, uh, changing their buying habits within the, the food and beverage industry in the next few years? I think that consumers have become much more demanding. Um, a lot of them have, um, at, at, at least in the space um, that I'm working. And I think that it's, yeah, it's, it's a good thing because it, it also it challenges companies, it challenges startups, it challenges entrepreneurs. Um, but it, it also enables companies to, to bring out products to maybe charge a premium for, for uh, things that wouldn't have been sellable, especially in a, in a space like Germany. And as you know, we have, we have probably the most expensive cars in Europe and we drive to the cheapest supermarkets in Europe. Um, it's, and, and, and that is, is, a, is a tough, tough situation for, for a lot of food companies that, that want to um, bring or that want to um, bring sustainable products to the market. If you zoom out for a moment, uh, here's a, a way to think about the, the big picture in the Western world. It's slightly different in the emerging markets, but uh, if you say any change has to go through the four stages of attention, interest, desire, and finally action, where are we in, against those stages? And when you process the main consumer research of the Western countries, you, I think it's fair to say that we are at about 100% attention now. We've got consumers' attention. And there is, I don't think there are many people left who haven't heard about issues of sustainability and uh, related items. But then already at the next level of interest, active interest beyond the stage of awareness, you're down to two thirds. So you have in the US, in Europe and in some of the other Western type markets, about two thirds of consumers would say, yeah, I find that relevant. I find that interesting and I want to learn more about it. And then you've got the next stage, desire, where the number goes down to one third. So you've got one third of people who would agree that they need to act in reducing meat consumption, for example, choosing for the less uh, polluting package option, etc. That's one third. And then finally, you've got about 5% who are really consequentially taking action in their own lives. And I want to illustrate that just with one number, which is fascinating. In the United States, about 80% of grocery stores carry organic label products nowadays, which is a phenomenal progress in the last 10 years. But of those total grocery sales in the US, only about 4% are covered by organic products. So that's your your 5% people taking real consequential action. And then you wonder why the gaps from one level down to the next in this ladder. And obviously, uh, there are a number of barriers coming. So you mentioned one earlier already, which is affordability. When the organic version of a product is at a double premium to the regular version, there are a lot of people who simply cannot afford that or don't want to afford it. And then there are other, uh, other barriers that people need to overcome. But I think that's roughly where we are today with the encouraging message that it's come a long way and it's accelerating in the way this uh, adoption of sustainability into personal lifestyles is evolving.
the funnel you just described, you know, like a lot of lot of interest, but then it kind of narrows down in in, in online marketing, when we look at a when we, we, we love funnels, of course, and when we look at it like um, people having interest in a website and then the conversion rate, people actually buying on a website might be very small. But I think the good thing is there are two ways to tackle that problem. So you can either try to increase the conversion rate or you can just put more stuff into the funnel, like generate more traffic for your website. And I think um, just to add on, on your thoughts, and I, I think it's really good to see that even though the funnel narrows and not that many people actually buy solely organic products, it's still good to see that a lot more good stuff is coming on top, you know, and that a lot of companies are aware of it. I think that's a, that's a great development, but as you described, we still have a very long way to go. Well, I mean, here, here in the States, uh, uh, one of the retailers uh, uh, that grew uh, significantly Whole Foods on, on that whole sustainable uh, platform was always at a huge premium. Now we go to the opposite side of that cost spectrum and, and, and go to to an Aldi, which which sells products at a at a much more affordable level, and uh, a tremendous number of uh, sustainable organic products that are now marketed or sold at Aldi at a at a much much more competitive price. So you can see that really starting to take hold. Uh, and, and why does Aldi do that? Why does a low assortment store offer those products? Because there's demand, you know? So yeah, I think that's, that's, that's clearly an evidence. What's fascinating though, getting back to the subject of supply chains is that we are experiencing right now a phenomenal diversification of portfolios. So any brand, any retailer, uh, as Max mentioned before, now would offer the same category of product in a bio or organic version, in a regionally sourced version, in a regular version, and typically in some sort of discount price version. So the pressure and challenge that puts to supply chains, warehousing, logistics, and SKU man management couldn't be more dramatic than what we are seeing now. And again, phenomenal opportunities for information-based, uh, digital-based systems that enable the handling of all that in a way that's cost-efficient. Yeah, I just think about the impacts of of all of that um, diversification of a portfolio, you know, the the extension of that portfolio, and now add to that the pressure that everybody has this limited amount of retail space. So when you add more variety to that limited space, that means the order quantities go down, the variety goes up, you need to replenish more frequently. So all of those pressures uh, just make the complexity of the task just vastly, vastly higher. That's it. Since my background is in, is in mass customization or... If, you, if you've never heard of the company I, I worked for previously, it's a company where you can mass customize your newsly online and you have more than 566 quadrillion opportunities <laughs> for possible combinations. And That's so, some complexity, yeah. Yeah, as you mentioned, as, as both of you mentioned, I, I would argue that complexity, of course, means like more work, more strategic planning. It's, it's, it's tough. But it also, and I think Henrik, that, that that you already mentioned that it also creates opportunity. It also creates if you if you're able to handle that complexity, if you're able to really own that supply chain, so to say, then I think um, yeah, you have a big advantage um, as opposed to, to 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 companies who are not able to do that. I mean, one of the things that the pandemic is doing to us is forcing us to think more. Uh, in a more agile fashion within in our supply chains, you know, themselves, you know, 
uh, everybody had to eat at home. So all of a sudden, all the stuff had to be packaged for, for grocery stores. Oh, wait a minute. We're going back to restaurants. We now have to start packaging for restaurants. And we much more rapidly than ever before need to, to be able to move from uh, one kind of demand to another. Yeah. And I think it's especially for me, as a con from a consumer point of view, it became really visible um, not the complexity, but the, the, the sheer opportunity. Um, if you look at the last mile, for example, like uh, like 10 years ago, you were like, wow, there's food delivery. And now it's like, <laughs> do I want it? Do I want it mailed? Do I want it within 10 minutes, 30 minutes next day? It's really interesting, I think, to see where that goes, because I, I, I once heard a um, talk from a scientist involved with the future and he said that the problem is that we humans we think that development always goes like this but it truth like moore's law processing power doubles every 18 months it will go progressively like this so i i, I think i will be interesting to hear your thoughts on that too i think that it will be astounding to see what will happen in the next five to ten years if we compare it to um the previous decade changes are happening also rapidly and and, and you know, the the blurring of lines between where you buy something from. Do you buy it from a store? Do you buy it from producer? Do you buy it by subscription? You know, all of those things are, 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 are creating a tremendous amount of dynam dynamicism, making very dynamic supply chains. <laughs> We're going to move a little bit further into the supply chain. Kind of really connected to to um, where we're where we are right now in this discussion, and that is, you know, how do we see consumer sentiment regarding sustainability, regarding their expectations, et cetera, affecting some of the peoples, the processes, the technologies in the warehouses of tomorrow? Consumer insights are always tricky and somewhat non-linear and not coherent and uh, it's just that consumers have a tendency to not do exactly what they are telling you they are intending to do so there's a gap between intention and action uh, just one example 60 percent of consumers pay attention to environmental impact of food in the european union but only 20% of them have adjusted their diets. And uh, so if you go by the survey, you would expect a 60% portion of consumers to eat less or no meat, but it's only 20%. So when we scan the landscape for consumer insights to use to solve sustainability challenges going forward, we have to be very careful of how we interpret what people are telling us. Uh, there is a second issue, which I think is of very high relevance to this conversation, which is that in the space of sustainability, about 95% of consumers have very limited knowledge and usually much less knowledge than they think they have which in consequence leads them to have different interpretations of issues of sustainability than experts would have, which in consequence leads for different consumers to have different areas of focus in what they expect to happen in sustainability. So what may be a priority of animal welfare for one, maybe a priority of work ethics for another one or a priority of micronutrients for better health effects uh, for the third one. So as a consequence of all that, I think what's going to happen is this phenomenon of diversification of portfolios is going to accelerate even more because in the absence of a common definition, suppliers, producers, manufacturers, and the related partners in the supply chain will have to get ready to give people what they want. And what they want becomes more diverse by the day and with more and more information being available, if that makes any sense. Right. So there's, there's the age-old saying, uh, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. 
you know that's exactly the the it's it's what that individual's priority is which is going to vary from individual to individual that's going to drive uh, that decision. I mean, I, I, I look at, I, I think of the topics of individualization and premiumization is tailoring to that exact need, right? I always love to, love to say that um, people love customization, but they hate to customize. So and I think that is, that is a dilemma that not only the food and beverage industry faces, like, like everyone wants to have, for example, a personalized product, but actually going through a configurator and you're not going to do that for every product and and kind of like when you when you were sharing those numbers i i thought of a very early my muesli survey that we did non non-academic of course we, we were students back at that time before we started the company we had this questionnaire and we asked people all kinds of questions but we also asked them like would you buy muesli online and we we shared with I think more than 1,000 people, and we got lots of answers. And the very encouraging answer was that zero percent said yes, I would buy it online. I'm glad <laughs> we still started the that we still started the company. But yeah, I, I can totally relate to what you said, Henrik, because it's it's like people will tell you yes, I I love organic products. I'm not gonna eat meat for the next 10 years, and and yet what they do um. A lot of times differs and, and and I think what that means for companies is you just have to try out more stuff. I don't think that there will be that many product launches 10, 20 years um, ahead where where a company will invest tons of money and just throw it like like on, on all kinds of countries. But um, and like, as you have more experiences with, with larger companies, of course, I would love to know your thoughts on that. Like how will companies react to the fact that surveys can't probably always tell you the truth and if, if if customer adaption will actually happen yeah and it's it's it really becomes um one one surveys you know i think what you're talking about is mining for truth right well yeah the i guess the one uh, solution to the dilemma of interpreting consumer uh, insights is to always keep a very close eye on the behavioral and make sure to not over interpret the attitudinal. So the more you can orient your monitoring of consumer behavior, uh, orient your efforts to monitoring behavior rather than necessarily uh, betting too much on intention and belief statements, I think the safer you are with investment decisions that follow those insights. But uh, I would add that um, there is, I think, the, the other rule that the total is bigger than its individual pieces and the same applies to supply chains. So if as a supply chain company in warehousing, or in shipping, or in uh, any sorts of transportation, you have the opportunity or capture the opportunity to reach out to your upstream and downstream partners in the supply chain of the same product. Chances are that the collective wisdom will produce solutions that are better than each individual member of the supply chain acting in isolation. And I would very much emphasize that as a recommendation in today's world where uh, collaboration is so much more uh, feasible through the technology we use, but also, I think, because of different mindsets than, say, 20 years ago when mindsets were perhaps more uh, oriented to competition. And uh, I think with those sorts of things, there are ways to reach, even in a very complex uh, environment now, very solid investment decisions that benefit entire uh, supply chains, that benefit entire ecosystems of community, so to speak. Yeah, I, I, I find it fascinating. Back uh, 12, 13 years ago, 
uh, ran across Future Value Chain 2020 that was, I think, starting to be compiled in 2009. And, and it's amazing the quality of the crystal ball as far as collaboration across supply chains, uh, uh, digitally enabled consumer. I mean, all those things that were predicted. I mean, we're living it today. It was really, really pretty fascinating. Uh, which brings me really to our, our, our last topic, and, and we're, we've been wandering into this or in our dialogue, and that's uh, the linkages that we look to in the future with automation, with digital, uh, with AI, and the consumer, and, and how we might see that all interacting going forward. I think we could elaborate on that topic for a very long time. But... <laughs> Everyone says that, and you've heard it tons of times, but I think we're really at the beginning of something. Like what we're about to witness in the years going forward, and when it comes to um, the topics mentioned, is gonna, yeah, it, it, it's gonna be astounding. And I think that um, the way we, for me personally, growing up in the, in the 80s and 90s, for example, if you look at voice interaction, voice interaction with a speaker, voice interaction to actually order food through a computer um, with a voice interface um, that for me was really felt like one of the biggest game changers, honestly. It, it was like being in a science fiction movie. And I think that these technologies will have a vast impact on, on you don't need to watch this, but everyone will probably agree, vast impact on our lives. Um, but for me, it's it's still very foggy in terms of like what will actually happen in ten years, twenty years. Um, would love to know your thoughts about on that topic. One thing that doesn't stop fascinating me in what I can see, and my horizon is as limited as anybody's. But what doesn't stop fascinating me is when you look at the main sustainability goals and. I think the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals are a very good point of reference. Zero waste, uh, zero emissions, um, fresh water availability to every citizen on the planet, and pick your other ones. When you look at those, the impression I'm having is all the solutions already exist. They are already there. And the challenge ahead now is simply to put them into practice in a way that's scalable and that maintains the financial sustainability of our economies and our companies and our private households. That is it. But it's all there. So it all comes down now to all of us getting much more open-minded in finding the solutions that already exist in some place, maybe not in an obvious place, bringing it to where my area of responsibility is in how we work as a society, and then teaming up with the other people linked to the same issue and goal in a way that's productive. That's the challenge ahead, and I think we can do that. It's a good point, and if I may add really quick, it I hope that going forward, that especially larger companies, we talked about the subject of collaboration. We talked about that, and you said that, like, it, it, that's a very good point you just made, that everything is available already. But I hope that, especially for startups, when I remember, you know, you walk into a fair, you approach a big company, and like, we have this great idea, and everyone's like, hmm, oh, So I hope that, that this will really foster collaboration between larger and smaller companies, because if if you share an idea, if you say, oh, we could enable Bluetooth and, and combine it with that kind of packaging, we could do so many great things. If the person on the other end actually says, it's not something we're doing yet as a company, but hey, let's think about it together and um, uh, how we can apply that technology to, 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 to your product. I think that would be really great if everyone was starting to become 5% braver or 10%. Um, I would really love to see that. Just a, a little bit more, a little bit more uh, adventure there, huh? Yes, that would be cool. Well, uh, Henrik and and Max, I I truly appreciate the time we spent together today. Uh, I think it flew. Uh, I think we've actually gone over 
you know, we, we've we've gone over a bunch of great great points, uh, some some interesting thoughts. Uh, it'll be uh, interesting to see where this future takes us. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Henrik and Max. Uh, really interesting conversation today. Uh, a lot of great topics uh, came up. I, we really, uh, truly appreciate you participating in this event, and I wish you both a, a, a great day.